got anxiety, depression, or OCD, you can see it on a brain scan. I've scanned more than 250,000 brains from people from 155 countries. One in four people will experience a mental health problem each year, but mental health conditions are actually brain health issues, and knowing this makes them easier to treat. 54% of teenage girls report being persistently sad. 24% have planned to kill themselves and 13% have tried. This is unlike anything we have experienced in my lifetime, maybe ever. Unlike traditional psychiatry, my guess goes beyond what people are feeling. I fell in love with the only medical specialty that never looks at the organ it treats. Think about that. And he's about to share how you can make yours absolutely bulletproof. Freud was wrong. Penis envy is not the cause of anybody's problem. It's the brain. The thing you want to really want bigger, better, healthier is your brain. Welcome to the Health Optimization Podcast. I'm Tim Gray, the UK's leading biohacker. This podcast is all about gaining actionable advice from the world's top experts and sharing new breakthroughs in nature, biohacking, technology, and longevity research to help you live longer and happier. Everything I cover on this podcast are the things I've learned from the world's top medical professionals, researchers, scientists, and authors in the health field. However, I'm none of those things. I'm just someone with a very keen mind for figuring out how to be as healthy as possible while aging gracefully and learning from the best. My only bias is health. You're not stuck with the brain you're born with. With proper mental hygiene, you can fight anxiety, panic, and depression. You can boost your memory, conquer impulsiveness, learn to focus, and stop obsessive worrying. Dr. Daniel Amen is a 12-time New York Times best-selling author, neuropsychiatrist, and social media sensation. He's the founder of Amen Clinics, Amen University, and the brain health supplement line, BrainMD. His patients include the likes of Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus. He's also got a hugely popular YouTube and Instagram series called Scan My Brain, which features high-profile actors, musical artists, athletes, entrepreneurs, and influencers. He and his team have scanned hundreds of thousands of brains, and in this episode, he's going to share the tools and strategies he's learned for creating a strong and resilient brain. He's also recently teamed up with child psychologist Dr. Charles Fay to write a groundbreaking new book called Raising Mentally Strong Kids. It's a topic close to my heart, and we'll find out all about it soon. Dr. Eamon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to this because I've been following your work and wanted to meet you for years, actually. So I'm going to I'm going to jump straight right in and start by asking why brain health and what brought you into this field? Well, your brain, the physical functioning of your brain moment by moment creates your reality. It's involved in everything you do, how you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people. It's the organ of loving, learning character and every decision you make. Yet very few people love or care about their brains. And that's my mission. When I was 18, long time ago, uh, the Vietnam War was still going on and I became an infantry medic where my love of medicine was born. But about a year into it, I realized I didn't like being shot at. It was not my thing. Some people like it. it wasn't for me. And so I got retrained as an x-ray technician and developed a passion for medical imaging. As our professors used to say, how do you know unless you look? And then 1979, I'm a second year medical student. Uh, I just got married. Two months later, my wife tried to kill herself. And I was horrified. I took her to see a wonderful psychiatrist. I came to realize if he helped her, which he did, it wouldn't just help her, that ultimately it would help me. It would help our children, even our grandchildren, as they would be shaped by someone who is happier and more stable. So 45 years ago, I fell in love with psychiatry. I've loved it every day since then. But I fell in love with the only medical specialty that never looks at the organ it treats. Think about that. 
every other medical specialist look at the organ they deal with, psychiatrists guess. And I didn't like it then. And in 1991, so I'm a psychiatrist for nearly a decade, and I always felt like I was guessing. I went to a lecture on a study called Brain Spect Imaging. Spect is a nuclear medicine study that looks at blood flow and activity, looks at how your brain works, and it changed everything I do. Over the last, what is it, 33 years, I've scanned more than 250,000 brains from people from 155 countries. And the big lesson, most psychiatric illnesses are not mental health problems. They're brain health problems. Get your brain healthy and your mind will follow. And that aha set me on this course to help people have better brains and better lives. And every day you're making your brain better or you're making it worse. Amazing. What an awesome story. And it's something I keep on hearing the more episodes I record and the more authors and specialists I speak to is they found their expertise through a place of need to their life and then help the world with the information they've learned. And it's like, it's, it, it's actually really amazing. And I love how, how it motivates us to do better and help the world so much. So I really, I really, really appreciate this part of your, your story. So in your book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, you offer quite a lot of actionable advice, actually, based on the lessons from that massive database. I think you said 250,000 brain scans. What have you learned from those scans that's been fundamental in this? You are not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better. I can prove it. That's why the book is called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. Every day, if you sleep well, if you eat well, if you exercise, if you stop believing every stupid thing you think, your brain is better. Mm. Every day, if you rely on marijuana or benzos or alcohol and you don't sleep and you're addicted to video games, your brain's worse. And I, I find that so empowering that I'm not stuck with the brain I have. And when I first looked at my own brain in 1991, I was not happy with it um, because I played football in high school. I had meningitis twice as a young soldier. I had bad habits. I thought I was special because I could get by on less than four hours of sleep at night. And then I realized I wasn't special. I was stupid <laughs> and I needed to love and care for my brain. And interestingly, the week before I scanned myself, I scanned my mom. She was 60 at the time, and she had a stunningly beautiful brain. And I was 37, and my brain didn't look nearly as good as hers. And I developed this concept for myself, and I teach it, called brain envy. I wanted her brain. So I always say Freud was wrong. Penis envy is not the cause of anybody's problem. It's the brain. The thing you want to really want bigger, better, healthier is your brain. It's, a, it's actually, I, lo I love that you say you can change your brain because I, I have a background in cognitive hypnotherapy and my ex-partner, she was a psychotherapist and that she never, ever, ever asked, what are you eating? And when you when you understand proteins and neurotransmitters, it's just like, do you realize you're talking through something that you're not even putting the foundations in place to help your brain operate? And then you know, wonder why we have all these all these issues and emotional issues and br lack of brain power and things. I just find it so strange how how it's not more, more common knowledge. Isn't it insane? Mm -hmm. Most therapists never get any training in brain health. By the way, I'm a huge fan of hypnosis. When I was a medical student, uh, I did a whole month elective uh, in learning how to hypnotize people. And it's been a very important part of my career. And I think of people in four big circles. What's the biology? What's the physical functioning of your brain and body? That's really important but also what's the psychology. So if you think of biology as the hardware of your soul, well, psychology is the software. It's the traumas you've had in the past. It's 
how you think. It's the sort of day-to-day -day programs you run in your brain. And then what's the social circle? How are you getting along with the people in your life? How's your money? How's your job? How's your health? And then there's this spiritual circle, which most psychiatrists would never touch. But it's why the heck do you care? What is your deepest sense of meaning and purpose? Your relationship with God as you understand it, your relationship with the planet, with the past. So for me, that's my grandfather with the future, my grandchildren, um, really getting into that essence of who you are and why you're here. So it's all four circles working together all the time. Mm, I love that. I really love that. And I wish that they taught this to therapists, psychotherapists, hypnotherapists, everything. So bring it all together. It just seems, it like you said, it seems insane. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. And yet they're still doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> And not getting better results. The incidence of mental health problems is skyrocketed. Before the pandemic, uh, we were at record levels of anxiety, depression, suicide, and deaths from addiction. Before the pandemic, and then everything got worse. Yeah, I can imagine. So why is it important to know the physical changes in our brain to help us tackle brain health issues? Well, if you don't understand, if you don't love your brain, then you don't care. And then society will dictate how much you drink alcohol, whether you smoke marijuana, eat bad food, get addicted to video games. When you love your brain, it begins to change everything. But nobody loves their brain. Why? You can't see it. You can see the wrinkles in your skin or the fat around your belly. And you can do something when you're unhappy with how you look. But because the brain is one of the organs we don't screen, right? I mean, we screen your colon, we screen your heart, we screen your breasts, but nobody screens the brain. And that's insane. When I turned 50, my doctor wanted me to have a colonoscopy. I asked him, why didn't one look at my brain? Wasn't the other end just as important? <laughs> and, and, you know, I live in Newport Beach, California, and I often say we have more plastic surgeons here than almost anywhere in the world. And we care more about our faces, our boobs, our bellies, and our butts than we do our brain. And <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> It is. It's, it's like the the difference between the painkiller and the the multivitamin, isn't it? One that we have we need immediately, and we fit, see the impact immediately, such as getting rid of wrinkles with Botox or fillers or whatever, versus you know doing the changes on the inside from the gut, which takes you know six months a year to hit. And I think people all want the instant result. And I think you know, obviously plastics does do, <laughs> plastic does do that. But when it comes to the brain, I guess you can't see instant results. In fact, actually, I think you can. <laughs> No, you can. I have a study I did with a mixed martial artist who came to see me. I was in the middle of doing the world's largest study on active and retired NFL players. So I've scanned and treated 400 NFL players. Uh, and I gave a lecture to, to our patients. And this kid, 25 years old, he said, you're not going to like what I do. And I'm like, what's that? He said, I'm a mixed martial artist. I said, well, probably bad for your brain, but I like you. Let's look at your scan. So I looked at his scan, clearly damaged. And I said, I know these supplements work because I published a study with my NFL players, but I don't know how fast they work. Come tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. I'm going to give them to you then. And then we're going to scan you at 1030. So two and a half hours later, his brain was remarkably better. Now, it wasn't going to stay that way unless he stopped hitting himself, you know, had other people hitting him in the head, and he had to take them over time. But your brain can change quickly if you do the right things for it. I mean, I notice that if I have quality 
branch chain amino acids and essential amino acids after waking within 30 minutes of waking and my brain is alive i feel like it's amazing i put that down to obviously just deficiency or not having enough of the right proteins at the right time so aminos feels like it's a right a real shortcut for that but i guess if i was to have a scan or, or to look to see what was actually going on i guess the brain activity would be significantly better as a result when you do the right thing your brain is better i was on an emmy winning program called the truth about drinking and we scanned this kid who had alcohol problems sober, getting them sober was hard, uh, sober for a couple of days. And then on national television, we got him drunk, just like he would get drunk on a Friday night. And it just crashed his brain. Mm. And this is so important every day with every decision. You're making your brain better or you're making it worse. And it all comes down to this one question. I horrified myself when I'm like, oh, this is the question of brain health. Whenever you go to make a decision, just ask yourself, is this good for my brain or bad for it? And if you can answer that with information, and quite honestly, most seven-year-olds know things that are good for their brain or bad for it. If you can answer that question with love, love of yourself, love of your family, love of the reason you believe you're on earth, you just start making better decisions. So can you just look at a brain scan and know that there's something wrong? And like, what are the signs you know, we never make a diagnosis just from a brain scan. We take really thorough, detailed histories. But the scan adds a lot of very important information. Is the brain toxic? Uh, for example, you're living in a mold-filled home. You might go to the therapist and they never ask you about that. Is it traumatic? You know, do we see the effect of past concussions that have never been healed? Does it work too hard or not hard enough? So this scan, the first thing, is it healthy or not? It'll tell us, this is so controversial, but it'll tell us you likely to be female or male uh, because we're wired differently. And it helps direct treatment. And the reason I fell in love with it, the first scan I ever ordered was on a 40-year-old woman who I believed had adult attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, 40 years old, had a suicide attempt the night before, was impulsive after she created a fight with her husband. She had an eight-year-old son who had ADHD. And I'm like, I think she has ADHD. And she goes, adults can't have that. And I laughed. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm the doctor. And I said, but I just went to this great lecture on brain spect imaging. I want to do a scan on you twice, once at rest, once when you concentrate. It's so funny. She didn't want to believe the diagnosis, but she's totally willing to get the scan. And when she tried to concentrate, her brain shut down an activity, which is classic for people who have ADD or ADHD. And when I put the scans on the table in her hospital room and explained them to her, she started to cry. And she said, you mean it's not my fault? And that's when I knew the scans were powerful to decrease shame and stigma and increase compliance. And I got hooked. Hmm. I'm not surprised. I love I love quantifying things like that. I mean, that's part of the reason why I think biohacking can become addictive because we see the data before we do something, we see the data after, and we can really precisely pinpoint things that a lot of other people can't and i guess so you've got like an extreme version of that with brain so I, no wonder so you've mentioned some already but can you list the top things that we're doing that are actually harming our brains on a day-to-day -day basis so i have a framework i like a lot called bright minds if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it we have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors. So let me use that framework. I won't talk about all 11 of them, but the B in Bright Minds is for blood flow. Low blood flow is the number one brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's disease. So what causes low blood flow? Caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, 
being overweight or obese, being sedentary, having a processed food diet. So how do you increase blood flow? And I love this about my program because for guys, if they do the brain health program I talk about in all my books, um, their erections are better. Their sex lives are better because it's all about blood flow. And if you have blood flow problems anywhere, like erectile dysfunction or heart disease, you have blood flow problems everywhere, including your brain. So how do you boost blood flow? Well, you get rid of those things that diminish blood flow and you exercise. Like walk like you're late for 45 minutes, four times a week. It's been shown to be equally effective to taking Zoloft, a really good antidepressants. Beets, oregano, cayenne pepper, the supplement ginkgo, the prettiest brains I've ever seen take ginkgo. Um, R is retirement and aging. When you stop learning, your brain starts dying. So new learning is an incredibly important strategy. I is for inflammation and things that'll surprise you. If you have gum disease, you probably have brain disease. Uh, so flossing, seeing your dentist on a regular basis, taking care of your mouth and the microbiome in your mouth is absolutely critical to having a healthy brain. Omega-3 fatty acids in decrease inflammation and support brain health. And then eating whole foods, getting rid of ultra processed foods uh, is critical. So you can see if someone moves from a, an ultra processed food diet, food, I use, let's say pseudo food, <laughs> um, through to a natural you know, plant and meat inclusive diet, you can see that their brains change. Oh, no question. Your brain is 2% of your body's weight, about three pounds, but it uses 20 to 30% of the calories you consume. And so if you have a fast food diet, you're going to have a fast food brain and it's not going to function nearly as well as if you're eating high quality meat, healthy fats, colorful fruits and vegetables. It's crazy because there's so many people saying it's fine to eat processed foods. It doesn't do anything to you. You just need to eat a little bit less and have less calories and you'll be fine. And yet, you know, <laughs> there you are quantifying. No, this is what it does to you. You should not do it. I love this. It's such an argument I get on on the social medias all the time when I say avoid processed foods. They're not good. And people are like, there's no science behind that. <laughs> but there's a brand new study out. I think it was last week that they looked at 400,000 people and looked at the issue of processed foods and it increased. It was like damaging to every cell in the body, including the brain and increased the risk of mental health problems. 30%. I mean, it was a very significant study, but if you know, because of how our society is, uh, I have a writing technique I like called if I was an evil ruler and I wanted to create mental illness around the world, what would I do? I'd addict people to process food. I mean, that's like one of the first things I would do. But when people do that on a regular basis, um, they get wed to the idea. And if you push against the idea, they're going to be angry. But we keep doing it because their anger doesn't dictate the truth. And ultimately, they eat a little bit better, and then they eat a little bit better still, and then they fall in love with themselves and get serious about their food. Then I guess their brain comes back online and they realize what they're doing wasn't so good for them and they start coming back online and it gets better and better. I guess it's the the snowball effect, but in the positive opposed to the negative. And, and I think my own behavior has radically changed uh, from medical school. And I, I used to eat terrible. I remember in 1991, I'm a double board certified psychiatrist and board certified in child psychiatry and general psychiatry. I was the top neuroscience student in medical school and I didn't care about my own brain. I was chubby. I wasn't sleeping. I'd go to Jack in the Box for lunch and have terrible <laughs> food. And I'm just like not thinking. 
about it. And then I fall in love with my brain. And the more I learned, like your brain's 2% of your body's weight and uses 20 to 30% of the calories. It's like, come on. And then it was, I don't know, 15 years ago, there was a study published uh, by my friend Cyrus Raji, uh, who's a professor at Washington University in St. Louis. And he published the first study. There's 15 studies since then. And I published three of them. As your weight goes up, the size and function of your brain goes down, which should scare the fat off anyone. And it caused me to lose 25 pounds. And so I'm just saying that because it's a process that when you learn to love your brain, you just don't automatically become masterful at brain health. And I have another book I wrote called Change Your Brain Every Day, 366 short essays on the most important things I've ever said. And I'm like, just three or four minutes a day, just read a page a day. And it begins to sort of seep in because, you know, some people, it's like, no, I want to be better tomorrow, which is four-year-old thinking, as opposed to, I want to be better tomorrow, but I want to be really better next year. And so doing it in a small, incremental way is the most effective way to really change your behavior long term. What about the psychological side of things? And like, what are your top tips of how to be mentally strong other than the things we've already covered, of course. Well, I have a new book I'm very excited about called Raising Mentally Strong Kids. And one of the big takeaways is you want mentally strong kids, you have to be mentally strong yourself every day. You are modeling mental strength or mental weakness by your own thoughts, your own behaviors. And a couple of things I love, especially for families to do, Start every day with today is going to be a great day. I mean, say it to each other. Today is going to be a great day. That way you're beginning to nudge your brain out of the negativity we evolved with because thousands of years ago it protected us uh, to a more positive mindset that now protects us. Today is going to be a great day. Then whenever you feel sad, mad, nervous, or out of control, write down what you're thinking. And then just ask yourself whether or not it's true. Thoughts come from all sorts of places. They come from the news we watch, the music we listen to. They come from the voices of our moms and dads when we were young, our friends and foes. Even some of them are epigenetic, that they were written into our genetic code by our parents or grandparents' trauma. And when you write down what you're thinking, your good frontal lobes, your more rational mind can just go, is that true? Do I really know that to be true? We live in a society of angry, undisciplined thinkers, which is why you got to turn off the news. The news is no longer the news. Turn off the news uh, because they know fear keeps your attention longer. And in order to satisfy advertisers, they want to scare you. And so turn that stuff off. But my favorite of all the techniques is when you go to bed at night, I say a prayer and then I go, what went well today? And I start at the beginning of my day looking for the most awesome things about my day. And I also look for the micro moments of happiness. Like we have um, stress at home. My mother-in-law has stage four lung cancer. It's public knowledge. My wife had posted it on her Instagram and it's horrifying. Now, my wife's a nurse, I'm a doctor. We can be really helpful, but as you can imagine, it's stressful. And when I went to bed last night, I'm like, what went well today? And my wife and I were walking up the stairs and I just grabbed her hand. And that was very special to me that even when we're in the midst of a tragedy, we can still support each other and connect. 
And I have done this for 13 years. What went well? And I remember three and a half years ago, my dad died. And um, when I went to bed, I did it just because it's my habit, right? The brain is lazy. It does what you teach it to do. And I'm like, what went well today? And the supervisor in my head goes, seriously? We're going to do that today? But I did it and remembered a couple of very special interactions with my mom. And then I went to sleep. It didn't mean I didn't grieve. I still grieve. But it meant I have control over my mind rather than the storms of the day having control over my mind. Mm. I think that's fantastic. I remember in my cognitive hypnotherapy studies many years ago, we, we were taught, I think it's called three gifts. And uh, there, apparently there was a study with three gifts, which are writing down three things from the day that were positive, you know, whether it's a, a beautiful bird, a sunshine, a sunset or something or other like that. And apparently there was a study done with three things that showed that it was more powerful than Prozac for depression. It's such a radical shift for the brain. It's something that I've done for a very long time. It's my my daily gratitude <laughs> that I mark in my notes app when I'm sitting in bed every night. And it really does work. But I've, I've listed down your two questions, actually, or, or your two statements. Today is going to be a good day and what went well today, because I think they're just so succinct and lovely. So it's going to be added to my newly my new routine. <laughs> Remember, if you want to learn how to take control of your health and you're sick of traditional healthcare and temporary fixes, you should come to the Health Optimization Summit. You can join other like-minded enthusiasts and meet the world's leading minds in health, wellness, and science. You can even test out a load of groundbreaking health tech and latest supplements. Get your tickets at healthoptimization.com. So tell us about more about your new book, actually, because what will parents learn about the brains and minds of their children? And, you know, how important is that for, for bringing up happy, healthy, successful kids? So I'm very excited about this because, you know, I'm also a child psychiatrist. And I think the most effective thing I do to help kids is help their parents be effective with them. And it starts with modeling. And then it starts with goal setting. What kind of children do you want to raise? I want to raise mentally strong kids. And what kind of parent do you want to be? You have to ask that question. And for me, I want to be present because I grew up with a dad that wasn't. And I was bitter about that for many years. Uh, I want to be present. I want to be firm because the best parents, two words, right? If you just remember these two words, they're firm. When they say something, they mean it, they back it up and they're kind. And if you can always default to being firm and kind, uh, you'll be a great parent. So the first thing is know what you want. Uh, I, I think that's so foundational for whatever we do, whether it's in our marriages, our work, our parenting, know what you want. The second thing is bonding. Uh, we live in a society that is so busy that parents are not doing a great job at actually spending one-on-one -on -one time with kids. And so I talk about an exercise called special time. 20 minutes a day, be in your child's space, do something they want to do that's reasonable. And during that time, no commands, no questions, no directions. It's so powerful because the more you're connected with them, the more attached, the more securely attached they are, that's the one thing that prevents mental illness. It's attachment. The second part of bonding is stop talking so much. As parents talk way too much. It, listen, be really good. And you, you remember in therapy school, they taught us active listening. So I teach parents active listening. Let your children solve their own problems. Because too often when we have low self-esteem, and I was guilty about this. I have six children for my older three, I like wanted to solve their problems. They had a problem, I'm totally wanting to solve it because it's feeding my low self-esteem rather than what are you gonna do about it? Let me listen 
And then let me ask this, what are you going to do about it? How do you think you're going to handle that? And solving things for kids feeds the parents low self-esteem, but it creates low self-esteem in the kids. The more kids can work and solve their own problems, the better they will be. So parents learn a lot about being okay with kids making affordable mistakes. So for example, if my daughter, uh, when we really got this right, would forget her homework, we're not bringing it to school. If she forgot her lunch, we're not bringing it to school. If she didn't bring her sweater and it was cold, we're not bringing it to school because we want her to learn how to solve her own problems, how to be responsible for her life rather than being dependent on other people. Um, we have rules. I have my family rules. Society has rules. I think families should too, like tell the truth. Uh, we treat each other with respect, put things away that you take out. So there's a whole section on boundaries, uh, this section on discipline. But, you know, discipline comes from the Greek word disciple, meaning to teach. So if you feel like yelling, whisper, it'll help the child be very afraid. So <laughs> lots of very practical uh, tools to raise mentally strong kids. And the most important thing is modeling it. I can't wait actually to get my hands on a copy of it because it's um, obviously because of my, I guess my background and keen interest as preparing to be ready as a man to be a father. And, you know, I, the, the psychology of children or my my parents and you know my ex partner's parents and how it impacted lives so radically from minor tiny little things that had happened or said how it has such a I guess butterfly effect on who the who the adult becomes and so it's, I'm really really very looking forward to this book actually. So what's the most shocking fact about the current mental health epidemic amongst young people? It's so many. Um, brand new study out, 54% of teenage girls report being persistently sad. 34% have thought of suicide. 24% have planned to kill themselves. And 13% have tried. This is unlike anything we have experienced in my lifetime, maybe ever. Last year, there were 337 million prescriptions written for antidepressants in the United States. And 27% of all doctor visits, no matter what the specialty, someone is being prescribed a benzodiazepine uh, medication like Valium, Ativan, Xanax, uh, for anxiety. And they're bo both addictive and increase the risk of dementia. On the outside, as I look at it, it's a shit show what's going on. And nobody's talking to people about the health, the actual physical health of their brain, which then me and Jeff talked to them about their diet, level of exercise habits and so on. Those stats are shocking actually <laughs> absolutely shocking and I, I wonder i wonder out of those uh, those people how many of them actually eat natural foods and not processed foods I, i'd love to see <laughs> what the mental health problems are <laughs> with the people that are super healthy It'd be really interesting well and the american psychiatric association doesn't like have a position on food how crazy is that <laughs> They have positions on medication. And if you go to their annual meeting, you'll see huge boosts that obviously gave the American Psychiatric Association a lot of money for medications. But, you know, where's the love for food, right? And I think psychiatrists should be the leaders in brain and mental health, but they're clearly not. And that, breaks my heart, but also gives me a reason to get up every day and try to change psychiatry away. Uh, our mission at Amen Clinics is to end mental illness by creating a revolution in brain health. And so 
I wrote another book of mine that I dearly love. It's called The End of Mental Illness. And people, actually, I had a friend of mine, a pastor, uh, who I was close to, he says, you can't title it that. It's sort of like the National Enquirer title. And I'm like, no, that's the title. Uh, the end of mental illness. We need to end this concept and change it to brain health. Nobody wants to be called mental, right? Shames you. It's demeaning, diminishes you. Uh, but everybody wants a better brain. When I told my dad I wanted to be a psychiatrist in 1979, he asked me why I didn't want to be a real doctor, why I wanted to be a nut doctor and hang out with nuts all day long. Now, my dad would not get Father of the Year Award, but <laughs> he just reflected what society believes. And when I was over in the UK, uh, one of my friends uh, said, oh, no, people don't go to therapists here because then other people will think they are daft. And I'm like, we need to change this paradigm because therapy can be so helpful, especially if you add a brain health component to it. Mm, powerful, super powerful, actually. So if you had to boil it down, what's the secret, would you say, to successful parenting? Because I think it's a vitally important question that many people don't actually know the answer to intention bonding clarity but i want parents to be intentional and and know what they're trying to accomplish rather like one of the rules in my house is if you have a tantrum to get your way the answer is no it's always going to be no, go for it. And so I don't have tantrums in the house because I'm clear <laughs> with what I expect. Every time you give in to a tantrum, you've just made it more likely to happen. That ultimately we teach kids how to act by what we tolerate. So many parents have undisciplined thinking and they act out of guilt as opposed to intention. And guilt can just ruin relationships. I mean, I have I have a list of monthly quotes that I read from various different sources, and there's like about 150 now. And every month on the first of the month, I read through this list. And as you were saying that, and I've just I've just looked it up as you're saying it, behavior, whether good or bad, is intensely habit forming. Whether it when it is rewarded, make sure you reward what you want. And it's just so if someone's having a tantrum and you give them what they want, you're just going to be rewarding the tantrum. So I love that because it just fits straight into the model of what I've been training myself now, probably for about two and a half years i've read this list i love that so much and you know another way to say it is uh we teach people how to treat us by what we tolerate yeah and what we um there's behind me as you can see it there's a little penguin all of these have meaning behind me there's a brain there's a penguin i'll tell you the story about that there's an anteater got to kill the ants the automatic negative thoughts they're butterflies for you can change. And there's a raccoon. Uh, one of the strategies in the book is give your mind a name. Like stop believing everything you think. And if you have a mind that's hurting you, give it a name so you can separate from it. Like I named my mind after my pet raccoon, Hermie. Uh, and that way, if my mind's really starting to bother me, I can metaphorically put Hermie in her cage uh, so I don't have to listen to it. But there's a reason for the penguin. And uh, there's a whole section in the book on shaping behavior. And it's based on this story. So I said I have six children. My oldest I adopted. And he was hard for me, it was argumentative, oppositional, and it just wasn't any fun. And it was heartbreaking for me because, you know, I said I was not close to my dad and I desperately wanted to be close to my kids. And it was like, no matter what I said, he said the opposite. And I was in my child psychiatry training at the time. He was seven. And I was telling my supervisor, I'm like heartbroken. And she said, you need to spend more time with 
And that weekend, I did my child skytree training in Hawaii, the University of Hawaii and Tripler Army Medical Center. And that weekend, I took him to a place called Sea Life Park. Uh, sort of like SeaWorld. They had sea animal shows and we went to the whale show and that was fun and the dolphin and sea lion shows and that was fun. And at the end of the day, I took him to the penguin show and the penguin's name was Fat Freddy. And Freddy was fat and super cute. And he comes on the stage, climbs a ladder to a high diving board climbs it, goes to the edge, bounces, and then jumps in the water. And I'm like, whoa. And then the little penguin gets out of the water. He bowls with his nose, counts with his flipper, jumps through a rope of fire. And I'm like, whoa. And I'm mesmerized as my son is by this penguin. And at the end of the show, the trainer asked him to go get something. And Freddie went and got it, and he brought it right back. And in my mind, I went, damn, I asked this kid to get something for me. And he wants to have a discussion for like 20 minutes. And then he doesn't want to do it. And I knew my son was smarter than the penguin. <laughs> so I went up to the trainer afterwards and I said, how did you get Freddie to do all these really cool things? And she looked at my son and then she looked at me and she said, Unlike parents, whenever Freddie does anything like what I want him to do, I notice him. I give him a hug and I give him a fish. And the light went on in my head that even though my son didn't like raw fish, that whenever he did what I wanted him to do, I paid no attention to him because like my own dad, I was a busy guy. But when he didn't do what I wanted him to do, I gave him a ton of attention because I didn't want to raise bad kids. So I was reinforcing negative behavior rather than positive behavior. So I collect penguins. I have 2,000 of them, don't ask. Um, <laughs> because they just remind me to notice what you like more than what you don't like. I mean, imagine if Freddie was having a bad day and the trainer got a stick and beat the penguin. That wouldn't have been good. The penguin would never again perform for that trainer because of the fear, anxiety that would be attached to that. But, you know, many of us grew up at a time when parents would be physical with us and that's not helpful mm -hmm. for parenting right you it's time it's attention it's thoughtfulness it's kindness it's being mentally strong that raises healthy kids and so whenever you see penguins think of me Mm -hmm. I will do I love that story it's fantastic it's like it, you make me think about the attention thing it's a very very interesting point and what you've just told me about this will will stick with me forever by the way what kills me is when there's a mum or dad pushing a push chair playing on the phone and the kids walking next to them they're not even paying their attention and all the kids is looking at the mum or the dad for recognition and some attention and like this and i've i've been on the train or the tube or going wherever and i've seen this for like 40 minutes not a single bit of attention and the kid asking for attention like mom or dad and it's just like what is the psychological impact for our kids of us using our devices let alone the our own psychological impact from using and being addicted to these devices it's literally it's insane and the impact for the children that protect them from these things that are addictive and very toxic. Because, you know, one of the reasons that social media is so toxic, it creates a toxic level of self-absorption. You know, let me see how many people are following me. Let me see how many people are commenting me. It's one of the drivers of suicide in young girls. Um, it's this really weird uh, at attachment to attention. Yeah. 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 I agree. I mean, I've, I've gone through 
my growth online, I guess, from being a nobody that isn't connected with really anyone other than my five friends to having half a million followers and, you know, semi public, I guess the amount of hate, the amount of hate or nasty comments that happens on a daily basis, it really impacted my psychology for quite some time until you actually learn, you know, it's not about me, it's about them. So it's been a big, big part of my journey, actually, it coming through this. And it does, it does get you down. So yeah, I think for kids as well, like seeing the kids with all better, better lives, let's say better, you know, because <laughs> there's a snapshot, how much of an impact that can have on on growing kids and I, I luckily I grew up without a phone <laughs> I mean I was in the last group of people I think that I got a phone when I was 18 didn't have it as a kid so I'm very very lucky but I only think how bad it is for the younger generations something I want to ask is how can a parent tell if their parenting style is breeding mental strength or weakness and are there signs of how their children are there signs in how the children are actually behaving so in the book, uh, and I wrote this book with Dr. Charles Fay, who is the president of the Love and Logic Institute. And I love parenting with love and logic. My wife took it, really was helpful for our family. I recommend it to all of my parents of the kids I see. Um, and in the book, we talk about parenting along two dimensions. Are you firm? too permissive and are you hostile versus loving so that gives you four different types of parenting hostile and permissive hostile and firm loving and permissive loving and firm and there was a research study done out of the university of oregon on 10,000 parents looking at which of those four types raise the healthiest humans. And when they looked at the worst type, a lot of people guessed firm and hostile. So think of that's a drill sergeant type, um, but that's actually the second worst type. The first worst type is hostile. So no relationship and permissive, no supervision. So the parents who are hostile, but supervised actually raised mentally healthier kids. Now, it's not good for children to be hostile. It's also not good to be loving and permissive. Uh, the best type is be firm when you say something mean it and do it in a kind way, in a loving way. And we actually have a quiz online uh, to know what type of parent you are. And people can learn more about the quiz and more about the book at raisingmentallystrongkids.com. Amazing. Um, as you were saying that, I, I placed my mum into the best category of that <laughs> and my father into the second worst. So it's interesting how I have, you know, I have been working through father issues, <laughs> but I've never had a, m a mother issue. She's the most incredible mum I could ever imagine. And so it's just really interesting uh, how I'm using that matrix, <laughs> matrix from my childhood. It's actually fantastic. Well, and that's really important because if you're mom, you know, if I just think of children of alcoholics, something I've studied a lot, if your dad's an alcoholic, that's bad for which you. Which he was, which he was, yes. If your mom's an alcoholic, that's a disaster for you. Because, you know, moms, uh, for most families, are the primary caretakers for kids. Uh, so um, my first wife grew up in a pretty abusive alcoholic home. And uh, I talk about children and grandchildren of alcoholics and the impact that has on kids. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, there's so much juicy information that we've gone through today. And I think, you know, obviously in, in line with your, your new book, look, I think parents can often feel really overwhelmed and, there's so many, there's a plethora of things to always consider how to say something, how not to say something. How do you think they find the energy and the time to do all of these things that you're talking about? Well, I try to make it as simple as possible. Know what you want, 
uh, spend time with them, be a good listener, which means you actually have to say less, which is hard for people. But, you know, firm and kind. It's ultimately filter everything you say and everything you do, you know, with what you want and then just be firm and kind in the process. Uh, kids want to be connected. And like you said, I'm so glad you brought that up. Put the phone down. It's like, take a break. It'll be there uh, when you get back. They were purposefully created to be addictive. You know, Apple, Facebook, they want mind share. Mm. And you don't want to give it to them mm. because it steals from the people you love. Mm. I actually find that I'm getting anxious if I don't pick up my phone within a certain amount of time. <laughs> and I'm just like, I realize, obviously, I, I I would say I'm very well considered on my actions and my behaviors. But uh, even myself, I'm like, I haven't checked Instagram for 25 minutes. I should really check that. And I've like, <gasps> and it's actually really, it's really insane. Actually, really insane. So I think there's a research study that says people would rather give up sex than their phone. It's called nomophobia, <laughs> losing your phone. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely not choose to give up the other. <laughs> I'd lose the phone in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> Sign so, of a good testosterone level. Yes. Oh, yes. So um, <laughs> can this book be useful for par people that aren't parents? I mean, I know for myself as someone that would love to be a parent in you know the next few years, it's I, I'm going to get stuck into it, but do you think it applies to the wider, wider audience as well? I do. It applies to grandparents. It applies to aunts, uncles, anyone who spends a significant time with children and want to be empowering to the children. So finally, what's the number one thing the listener can start doing today to start building their own mental strength and resilience? So I horrified myself a couple of years ago when I went, brain health is three things. I can summarize it in three words. <laughs> I'm like, really? Care, right? Nobody cares about their brain. Start caring about the three pounds of fat between your ears. Stop doing anything that hurts it and start doing things that help it. And so it ultimately comes down to this one question that takes you three seconds to ask, is this good for my brain or bad for it? So when you think of, oh, I'm playing a video game and I just want to get to the next level and those things are hypnotic, right? So you know one of the features of hypnosis is time gets distorted, right? Put somebody in a trance, you go on for 30 minutes and they go, how long do you think that was? And they're like, five minutes, maybe eight minutes. They're like, no, it's 30. Wow, really? Time gets distorted. Time gets distorted when you play video games. So it's like, oh, no, got to go to bed at 10. Because when I sleep, my brain cleans and washes itself. Got to go to bed at 10. And you just start making better decisions if you have that supervisory question in your head. Is this good for my brain? or bad for it, and then teach your children that. I have a game I talk about in the book called Chloe's Game, where since the time she was two, I would like go blueberries. She'd go, God's candy. Uh, would say, hit in a soccer ball with your head. Really stupid. Brain is soft, skull is hard. And so you can totally play games and teach them, but that's the mother question, or the mother tiny habit. Is this good for my brain or bad for it? Fantastic. And what a what a wonderful way to end. So, Dr. Eamon, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It has been amazing. You know, I'm just so grateful to you for allowing me to spread the message of brain health and healthy kids. Thank you so much. Thank you. Massive thank you to my guest, Dr. Daniel Amon. Learn more about Dr. Amon at amonclinics.com and follow doc underscore Amon on Instagram. You've been listening to the Health Optimization Podcast. I'm Tim Gray. Comment and leave the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel to see more. See you next time. And remember, let's spread the health.